welcome. And, uh, so what I will, uh, is it time to start? Yeah, I guess it's time to start, I can start. Okay. Um, okay, I'll try to give you a general idea of what the gauge gravity duality is. So basically the gauge gravity duality is a relationship, it's an equality between two things. One is a quantum field theory, uh, or a theory of quantum interacting particles. Um, and such a quantum field theory is equal to a gravity theory. It's a relationship between two quantum theories. So this will be a quantum gravity theory. Um, and the way we currently have of constructing quantum gravity theories is via string theory. So this will be string theories. And the relationship will have the character that um, the gravity theory in the interior of some geometry. So you'll have some geometry which has an interior and some boundary. I'll be more precise in explaining what this is. Um, so the gravity theory inside will be uh, the same as a quantum field theory that lives only on the boundary, so on, on the boundary in this region. So you start with a quantum field theory living, let's say, on the surface of a sphere, and you get a gravity theory living also in the interior of the sphere. Okay? So that will be the basic relationship, and we'll try to understand it and, and describe it in more detail. So the whole talk will be about understanding this relationship. Okay? This is a conjectural relationship that um, is supposed to hold, and there is a various, uh, there is a lot of evidence for the relationship, and it can be used uh, in any direction. It can be used to understand gravity theories. If you're interested in understanding gravity theories and black holes and so on, you can use it because you can might understand quantum field theory. You might feel you understand quantum field theory, and then you understand gravity theory. Or uh, alternatively. Um, the, uh, there are problems in quantum field theory which are difficult to analyze in quantum field theory, but they become easy in the gravity theory. So the character of the relation relationship is that things that are difficult here uh, can sometimes become easy on this side. Okay. Good. So that's uh, the motivation. Now to, to try to explain it, so I, I'm going to take uh, some steps back and I'm going to describe uh, something which is the what happens with theories of matrices in the large n limit, in the limit that the, num the rank of the matrix becomes very large. So uh, imagine, so I finished the introduction, I'm now going to try to explain one point, which is the connection between large n gauge theories and uh, strings. So I'm going to connect large n gauge theories I'm going to say that these two things are connected. Strings or string theory. Um, and this is an argument that uh, is fairly old. It goes back to the 70s by Toft. And uh, it goes as follows. So imagine a theory that uh, contains matrices. So we have some matrices which have some indices, i and j. And they transform under the group un. So this matrix can be multiplied on the left by a UN transformation and the right by the inverse of that UN transformation. Um, and it could be various things. So it could be uh, some integral over matrices and then we'll have some action which depends on these matrices in a way that is invariant under the group UN. And it could be just an integral over a single matrix. So it could be just a single matrix integral simplest example is a sin single matrix integral. This is an integral over the n square components of the matrix, of the matrix, single matrix. And then an action which could be, let's say, trace of m squared. So this is a very simple uh, Gaussian integral. So we can put here a coupling, but this is just for fun. We can just uh, rescale the, this and nothing changes. So this is a, a sequence of just Gaussian integrals. So it's very simple. Um, and uh, we could make this a little more complicated by adding uh, something which we, we could call interactions, for example, an m cubed term. Um, and in this uh, circumstance, then um, this g will be the coupling, and you could expand in perturbation theory as you would do for a single, single integral, just the Gaussian integral. And then you expand this, in, you bring this down from the exponent, and you just expand in the coupling. You probably 
familiar with such expansions. Um, so these are examples. There are other examples which include, for example, matrix quantum mechanics, which could be uh, just a matrix uh, harmonic o oscillator, uh, just to make it. So now it's a path integral, one-dimensional path integral, integral d time of, we could have d0 m squared plus m squared, right? And this d0 is the time derivative plus the commutator with a0. a0 would be a gauge field. Uh, so here the transformations, the gauge transformations are, so here there were just global transformations. The, this integral is invariant and they're changing, uh, conjugating the matrix M by the UN matrix. Here um, we uh, have a local gauge transformation. It's a function of time. Uh, and here the only role of the gauge field is just to impose a singlet condition. So you take out of all the harmonic, so this is a sequence of, this is a series, this is a collection of n square harmonic oscillators and you can, um, each harmonic oscillator transforms under UN and you can consider the states that are annihilated by the UN symmetry. So there are UN singlets, okay? You can consider such oscillators and that's the, the physical content of this theory. So it's also simple and a little more complicated example is uh, Yam Mill's uh, theory which could be a theory in d dimensions, let's say, f could be in four space-time dimensions, for example, of the form trace f mu nu, f mu nu, um, and where f mu nu is the usual expression for the field strength in uh, Jan Mills gauge theory. d nu a mu plus commutator of a mu a nu. So here, a mu and a nu are just uh, n by n matrices. Uh, mu are the indices that run over the four space-time variables, space-time space -time values from 0 to 3. Um, and well, so this is the action for the theory, and then you do the path integral as usual, and g is the coupling constant. Okay. Okay, now, one interesting thing is that these theories uh, in some way simplify in the large n limit, in the limit that the number of the rank of the matrix increases. Sometimes n is called the number of colors, and that name comes from the fact that this, uh, this theory, in the case that n is equal to 3, and we take the gauge group SU3, uh, it's the theory of quantum chromodynamics, which describes the interior of nuclei, or the particles that describe nuclei. And um, Anyway, and that property was called color historically, and so that's uh, called chromodynamics uh, for n equal to 3. Or sometimes this is also called large n chromodynamics. Is this been clear? Or, well, I guess this is very clear for you guys. Uh, I hope uh, it's clear for everyone. Um, now, uh, so I'm going to try to explain why these theories uh, simplify in the large n limit. And in some sense, they become classical. So they become classical, become And by this, I mean, so one property that the classical theory has is that um, if you take uh, the expectation value of a product of functions of some variables, these expectation values um, in classical state, they will factorize, so let's say, g of p and q. They will just be uh, f of p and q, g of p and q, right? So expectation value of each of the functions individually. So if you have a function with a well-defined uh, p and q, so this uh, will be true. Now in this case, uh, what happens is that if you have uh, operators which are single trace, so trace of a bunch of matrices, so here A is not a particular matrix there, but it could be a product of various other matrices. For, for example, A could be, let's say, F cubed. Um, and um, you take another trace, trace of f to some other power, then uh, such correlation functions will, um, will factorize into the correlation function of just one of these traces uh, times the correlation function for the other trace of some operator. Um, and the basic reason this happens is that uh, when you um, consider uh, such an operator, 
you will, and consider these expectation values, let's say you evaluate this in perturbation theory, uh, you will start contracting the fields within each trace, and each of the fields will carry a color and an anti-color, and you can think of them as a kind of little uh, doublet with the color and the anti-color. Let me denote the anti-color with a cross and the color with a dot. And then, uh, if you contract two of them, you'll have to contract, well, the color of one with the anti-color of the other, and if they are all contracted within the single trace, so when you end up doing all the contractions, you will get a factor of n from, from summing uh, over this trace. Okay? Similarly here, however, when you contract a field from here to there, you will need to color correlate the index of this trace with the index of that trace. Okay? And so you will lose a factor of n. So that index n that was running here and was um, uh, running over n values that gave you the factor of n, you would not have in the case that you um, color co you color correlate this um, in, in the case that you consider a, a piece that doesn't fac completely factorize. So if you only contract within a single trace, you will have this factor of n, uh, extra factor of n, and that gets reduced in the case that you contract two separate traces. Uh, so it, that's a purely kinematic thing. It doesn't have anything to do with interactions. It's um, it's just how you contract the indices, it's just the entanglement that is present in these indices here, how you are summing over these indices. Um, so there is an extra interesting thing that happens when you consider the interactions, and this maybe I'll discuss in a little more detail. So um, imagine you um, are doing perturbation theory with, let's say, yam mills theory or some theory that has a cubic interaction. I mean, we could even be this theory here. Um, then, to lead in order, you have just the free propagation of the particles, or equivalently, you just have the Gaussian integral. You don't have this term. You just have the Gaussian integral. And this represents the correlation function for that Gaussian integral. And it's this matrix field, Mij, or could be Aij. Carries a color and an anti-color, and I'm going to denote them by i and j. So i is the color, and j is the anti-color. Two indices, one transforming in the fundamental, well, essentially in the fundamental U of u n, the other one in the anti-fundamental. Um, and now you consider an interaction. And so when you consider an interaction, you um, can draw a diagram that uh, where so this. These double line diagrams will be like Feynman diagrams, except that they are also keeping track of how the indices are contracted. This is what I was referring here to when I was talking about the contraction of the indices. So for example, if we start with something with indices i and j, well, we'll end up here with the indices i and j. Okay? But this index here in the middle could be an index k that runs from 1 to n. Um, and so the whole result of this diagram will have, let's say this is a further one. This will be of order g square n. So g for each the interaction at each of the vertices, and n for the number of colors that is running here. And each time we increase the number of colors, if we keep drawing the, the diagrams on the plane, we'll, uh, here we added two powers of g, and we add another power of n. So we'll get another back power of g square n. So that this particular diagram will go like g square n, while the one I drew before would go like and in this way, um, you see that uh, all planar diagrams have this form. However, uh, non-planar diagrams are not, um, are not of this form. So um, um, for example, um, if imagine you, uh, well, let's see. Uh, we could draw a very simple one. Um, could be to consider a correction, for example, to a propagator that has this form. Uh, in this case, we had this factor of n. Remember that we had the factor of n right now around the loop. Here, we don't have it because we have the index i. And um, so, well, here in this case, we'll just get the, um, well, yeah, this is too simple. Sorry. Let me. Um, OK, so let me draw it here. So we could take these two indices that come out here. And we could essentially join them back out here. And if you, um, if you were to do this properly, uh, you would find that um, in this case, there will be only one boundary. So we start here, 
and we go all around the whole diagram, and um, we uh, never encounter a free index. Okay? So this whole diagram will be down, well, will be of the same order as this in n, but of order uh, g squared squared. Okay? So it's down by a power of 1 over n. So the whole uh, diagrammatic expansion can be separated into planar diagrams, which are the diagrams you can draw on the plane as the ones uh, I drew before. This one is harder to draw. It comes out of the blackboard. It cannot be drawn on the plane. And all the planar diagrams uh, have a form of g squared n, while the non-planar diagrams are down by powers of 1 over n squared. So this is the, the leading one. Uh, they can be drawn on a torus. And as you go to higher um, genus surfaces, thing on things with handles and so on, you have lower powers of n. OK. Now, the fact that uh, the diagrams can be separated into planar and non-planar is a bit uh, reminiscent of string theory. Well, it's in fact exactly what you have in uh, string theory, where you can uh, consider uh, the, the leading contributions to some process that involve in strings come from diagrams you can draw on the plane, and then diagrams you cannot draw on the plane are corrections. Okay? But this is a very basic um, view of string theory. It doesn't tell us exactly what string theory is. It just tells us there, there is something that looks two-dimensional. Okay? There is, in this theory, is something looking two-dimensional. Now, this looks like an abstract thing in terms of Feynman diagrams. I mean, the thing that looks two-dimensional are precisely this chain of, of particles. So you have these particles which, um, where you have a color and anti-color, and they're all uh, correlated to each other. And they form uh, this kind of chains. Now, here these lines are just nothing else than the sum over the indices. The, each of these particles can be traveling in space separately, but the indices are correlated. So you have you might have created, let's say, two gluons here that start moving away from each other. But if the indices are correlated, they are forming a string in this sense. Okay? So the object doesn't need to be small or doesn't need to be held. It's not holding together. This one plus one dimensional, na this two dimensional nature or one dimensional space like structure. Um, I mean, I sometimes talk of two or one dimension. So it's one, dim one space dimension, one time dimension. Okay? That, that was the string analogy. And here, the one space dimension is some correlation that exists between the colors of these particles. So you have n gluons. Let's say they could be moving f apart from each other. And there is a correlation between the color of this and the color of some one of the next one, and so on. And when I say the first and the next, they don't need to be the this, this gluon doesn't have to be the closest to this one. They could be far apart from each other. So you could have a gluon here, another gluon here, another gluon here. Another gluon here Another gluon here, another gluon here. And the one that follows this one in color space could be this one, and then this one, and then that one, that one, that one, that one, for example. right? What determines what these lines are is how the colors are correlated. And what happens is that when the, these two colors are correlated, the interactions between them are, uh, are larger by a factor of n than the interactions with colors that are not correlated. So in Yammel's theory, essentially, to lead in order, the only particles that attract are the ones that carry the same color, exactly the same color index. And if they are, um, they are far from, if the colors here, here we have a sum over one of the colors, here we have another sum. These in general are not going, these two colors, most, for most of the terms in the sum, they're not going to be the same. So there will be no interaction between this, this particle and this particle, for example. The only interaction will be this particle and that particle. OK? Is this clear? Is it being clear? OK, so the whole point of this is that uh, in the large hand limit, a very general property is that they, the particles have a kind of two-dimensional structure. It's not, not in space, in this space of colors. Okay? No, this, for the moment, this has nothing to do with the structure they have in, in physical space. Of course, if the particles attract, as charges and anti-charges attract, I mean, electric plus and minus. These are like plus and minus electric charge. They will attract. And so because of the dynamics, they might choose to form something where spatially a color of one will be attracted to the anti-color of the other. And then they might form dynamically uh, something like a string. Okay? Um, that, that, but that's a question of the dynamics. Okay? Exactly what type of object they, they form will be a, a question of the dynamics. Um, but this is. Uh, a basic question about even the kinematics of, of this and 
a feature of the interactions in the planar element. Okay, so that those are the kinds of strengths this, uh, that appear in large and gauge theories. Um, and they seem a little mysterious because, well, they live in this color space. Uh, they seem to have something to do with, and um, the original motivation for introducing them was to analyze uh, jan mens theory where in experiment strengths are seen. So if you have, if you excite nuclei uh, high energies, you, well, high energies compared to the energies of the 70s, um, you excite strengths. Um, and these strings were seen in experiments, and that uh, was one of the motivations. But now, what, what is, uh, well, I should explain perhaps a little more what another word, another meaning of the word string. So here I've used the, the word string in a very loose meaning, uh, just meaning these color correlations uh, between particles. Okay? Now I'm going to start to explain the word string in the sense of uh, uh, usual conventional string theory. I'll try to give you an idea of uh, what conventional string theory is about. So in conventional string theory, we uh, talk about a string. And now we'll mean something slightly that looks slightly different from what we meant before. Uh, and f for, for the, our current purposes, a string will be a one-dimensional object physical object, which carries a tension um, and carries a mass per unit length. That's how you characterize any string. For example, a violin string will have some tension and some mass per unit length. And this characterizes the long wavelength oscillations of the string. Um, so here, uh, we have a string, which is infinitely thin. So everything is long wavelengths from this point of view. And the tension is equal to the mass per unit length. Uh, this is what's normally called a relativistic string. So if you had an excitation on this string, it would travel, at the, and you stretched it, and uh, you make a small excitation, it would travel at the speed of light uh, on top of the string. So it's almost the same as a violin string, except that its tension is much bigger than the tension of a usual violin string, and that's why the excitations travel faster than they travel along a violin string. So that's the string. And now if you had uh, such a string, you could uh, consider its uh, motion, so you could take a close, close string of this kind, and you can, uh, you can let it evolve. Um, so um, you can write down uh, the equations for such a string, which are similar to what you would write for a violin string. They follow from an action which is equal to the area of the, the tension times the area of the wear volume spanned by the string. So if it moves in space time, you just find the, the solutions by minimizing this uh, simple action which is very similar to the action you write for a particle. And well, then you uh, proceed as you would proceed for, well, you could uh, find the quantum version of this. So you could quantize uh, the, the string. I mean, that's simply uh, one way to do it would be to separate the motion, the classical motion of the string into normal modes. So different normal modes as you do for a system with many harmonic oscillators, or as you do for, let's say, a violin string where you have many oscillation modes and then you quantize each oscillation mode individually, as you do in condensed matter physics, where you have all the possible oscillations of a solid, and then you um, quantize the various phonons. Right? The phonons is the quantum of uh, oscillation. This is the same thing. Um, so you have all the normal modes, and you quantize that. And then what do you expect to have? So you have this little oscillating thing uh, that will have quantized uh, oscillation energies. right? Um, so if you compute the, and if, if you actually compute it, you, uh, you find that, uh, that the spectrum of possible uh, energies or masses actually is simple in terms of the mass squared. And it goes like some integer divided uh, times the string tension. Uh, the string tension sometimes is defined in terms of 1 over the string length. This is just a definition of what string length is in terms of the string tension. So the string has a dimension full constant, which is the tension of the string in units of 1 over length square in units where h bar and c are equal to 1. Um, and so here again, uh, the same quantity appears. And you should think of the string length as simply se setting how big this, uh, this object is when it's oscillating. Uh, so when it's oscillating and it's not excited too much, it's, um, it has uh, 
some characteristic size, which is of order the string length. OK, now, OK, so this looks uh, pretty uh, mild. It's not, not very, su this should not uh, surprise you at all. This is just some oscillating thing, and it's just quantized. It's a simple physical system. Now, one curious thing is that there are, when you go through all this, there are some things that would formally have mass equal to zero. Okay? Some states, the minimum oscillation states, have mass equal to zero. And some of them have spin equal to two. Okay? So you would think that such a string oscillating um, would correspond to an object that looks like a massless particle, moves at the speed of light, and uh, has spin equal to two. Now these are exactly the quantum numbers of the graviton or gravitational waves, which have massless, they are massless and have spin equal to two. Now, one interesting property of gravity, so independently of uh, string theory or anything like that, is the following. So imagine you, um, you have massless spin two particles and you postulate some interaction for them. You postulate the most general interaction you could imagine uh, a leading order in derivatives, what means that the leading order low energy interaction of uh, these particles um, in such a way that uh, you can think of um, in such a way that uh, the interaction at least contains the interaction you expect from gravity. That is to say that if you have a gravity wave, then the, this particle, let's call it a graviton, it couples to the gravity wave, it couples to the energy of the gravity wave. So if you have two gravity waves, they attract each other a little bit. Okay, as you expect from gravity. So if you just postulate that, this leading order interaction between, so you have a gravity wave, right? And it interacts with a gravity. It emits a long range gravity field, which is just telling you, well, here I am, I'm, I'm weighing something, okay? Um, so if you just postulate this interaction, then the whole structure of the theory is just fixed. Uh, all the nonlinear terms in the action are fixed and you just get uniquely the uh, structure of general relativity, okay? So that uh, of this action. Um, that's a, a very interesting and important property of gravity that just knowing the low, low energy, just knowing this uh, three point interaction, you determine the rest of the nonlinear interactions. Of course, it's uh, connected. So this is one way of deriving gravity. And of course, it's connected to the fact that the structure of gravity is fixed by general covariance and so on. So it's, it's very constrained. So that's a, that's a side comment. Uh, so in view of this side comment, I, you wouldn't be surprised if I told you that if you introduce some interactions between these strings, and then you consider the interactions of these strings at low energies, as long as these interactions are somehow consistent, they should reproduce the structure of general relativity. Okay? And in fact, they do. So if you, there's a simple way to introduce the interaction between these strings, which is just saying that the string has a fixed probability of splitting into two. So when two pieces of string cross, they can split um, and reconnect. And in terms of the space-time diagram, it looks like this. Uh, and behind this, this picture, there are precise uh, mathematical formulas that we don't need to get into, but uh, there are precise formulas behind this. And you can, with these formulas, you can compute the interactions between strings and then take the Low energy limit. By low energy limit, I mean energies less than 1 over Ls, or less than this string tension that uh, the, the parameter we were discussing. That's the same thing. It's the same thing. Um, and then at these low energies, the interactions are the same as those of general relativity. OK, okay this was my uh, blackboard of string theory, trying to explain string theory in one little blackboard. Um, are there questions? I guess I'm not stopping to for questions, maybe. When you say low energy, which order of magnitude? Yeah, this is less than the string tension. So depending on what the string tension is, low energy means different things. So if we had a string tension, um, which is uh, TeV, it would be energy is less than a TeV. If the string tension was uh, M Planck, it would be less than M Planck. If the string tension is uh, and EV will be less than EV. So it depends on uh, the physical application we'll have for, this, for these objects. And the standard answer people would have given you, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago would be 
that this string tension has to be of the order of the GAT scale. Okay, that, that was the leading model for how to connect string theory to the real world. But we, we won't have to do that, and we'll, we'll see that we don't have to do that. I mean, the, the string tension of the QCD string is, is lower than that, it's 1 GeV. Okay. Uh, so if we were doing uh, the, the strings of QCD, we were putting, setting the string tension to a GeV. Now for the QCD string, first of all, um, as we'll see, um, we should not think of them as living in flat space. So that changes a little bit this discussion, which this formula, for example, was the spectrum of strings in flat space. Um, and second of all is in for the QCD string, the, the interactions between strings are, uh, strong, are reasonably strong. So you have to include the interactions to get the right physics. So strings can break, for example. And of course, a QCD string is viewed as uh, you, you can also understand the QCD string is uh, what uh, what joins a quark and an antiquark. Um, so if you have a quark and an antiquark, there are core electric flux lines that go between them in or Faraday lines, um, and as opposed to electromagnetism, where these lines spread everywhere in space, in QCD they uh, form narrow tubes, such that when you separate them by bigger and bigger amounts they give you a constant energy density per unit length, okay? And so this tube is something, some object which behaves like a relativistic string, okay? Similar, I mean, similar to the ones I was talking about. In fact, this, uh, this, this spectrum of, uh, of thi this spectrum describes well the spectrum of mesons uh, of high spin. So if you make a little plot of, uh, uh, you know, sometimes people plot in terms, I forget whether they do it for m squared in terms of j or j. Um, so take the spin of the mesons, they all lie uh, nicely uh, along this straight line as this, uh, this curve is indicating. They go up from uh, spin one, up or sp yeah, spin one up to spin five, more or less. Um, okay, so um, very good. Now the simplest uh, string theory is to, ah, one more thing I need to explain and connect it to your question also. Now we say that string theory describes gravity at low energies, at energies less than this tension. Um, now string theory has a new parameter here which is the coupling, the string coupling, the strength of the interaction. So when we have uh, here the, for example, if we were in four dimensions, we will have here the Newton constant which has uh, units of length squared. And this Newton constant will be proportional to g squared times the string length squared. So for very, even if you fix the string length for very small g, the Newton constant will be very small. Okay? So in such a theory, you would have two length scales. One is the, the, the length scale at which quantum gravity becomes important, which is L Planck. And the other one, which is a longer length scale, which is when gravity gets corrected into string theory. Okay? Uh, let me see if I try to, if this is le length scale, there is ver this is zero, there is L Planck, very tiny, and there could be LS, which is bigger, and if you are trying to, if you are going with a microscope and you are looking at uh, some particles, you will see that at this distance, you will start seeing strings, okay, before you get to the Planck scale. And depending on what G is, this could come much earlier than this or not, okay, and we'll see in applications what's the relationship between these two. Um, now, connecting to what I was discussing here, um, I discussed there was this expansion in genus, so expansion in how complicated the surface of interactions of st for strengths is. So here I discussed the three-point interaction, but we could c consider, for example, the scattering, let's say, of two gravity waves would be described in string theory by a diagram like this. Uh, th there is some formula behind this, and this is the contribution that has the topology of a sphere. And then there are corrections that, uh, where this has a little hole, and this corresponds in the particle description, so in the particle limit, this corresponds to a bunch of Feynman diagrams like this, that would be the leading one I drew, but this one with the correction correspond to loop diagrams in gravity, so quantum corrections to, quantum gravity corrections to this, uh, to this process. And in pure gravity, this would be, uh, these type of diagrams are divergent, but in string theory, they are finite. Um, 
And that's one of the nice aspects of string theory, that, that it gives a theory of gravity that is perturbatively finite, that is finite in perturbation theory. OK. Now, so what you should get from here is that there is some theory uh, of quantum gravity, which is described as these uh, stringy objects, objects which are strings. You don't need to know all the details. Uh, one thing you, a picture that is useful to keep in mind is the following. That uh, if we have some space which is curved and we have the graviton, in Einstein theory would be point-like, in string theory is a little thing that has some size ls and uh, gravity will be good approximation as long as the radius of curvature r is much bigger than ls. So as long as this happens, you can, um, and if you're only interested at physics, which happens at scale of order r, you can forget about string theory, and you can use Einstein theory. Okay. So I'm only introducing string theory just to help you understand when you can forget about it, and when you can use purely Einstein theory. Okay. So you might say, well, why, why are you introducing it if I'm going to have to forget it? Well, uh, hopefully will, this will become more clear later. Uh, are there questions? Yeah. Can you explain more about this QCD string in the curved background? Yeah, I'll, I'll get into that. I mean, when I get, to, yeah, I'll definitely get into that. Uh, yeah, I think I missed a step, but how did you get from a, a, from a, string, a string diagram with a loop in it to a Feynman diagram without a, a loop that you just uh, Ah, removed? no, that, that was, I think that was my, my wrong, I didn't present it correctly. This string diagram is one without a loop. This is, was this Feynman diagram. Ah, okay, so and then I, then I drew, the problem is I drew and then I erased. I think I said it in a confusing way. And this one with the loop in it has, was the Feynman diagram with the loop in it. Okay. <coughs> okay. Any other question? Okay, so strings give you gravity. Okay, when this happens. Okay, so if this happens, you can go from strings to gravity and forget about strings. Okay, so if you don't want to know about strings, just forget them right now. Um, however, uh, the, the, the reason to introduce strings was to try to explain why uh, there is a connection between um, between gravity and quantum field theory, the relationship we started in the very beginning. So I didn't explain that yet. I haven't uh, explained it at all. I mentioned that uh, when you take large hand gauge theories, there are some objects that look like string, strings. First, because there are these strings in color space. Second, in theories like QCD, there are actual physical strings that are measured in experiments. Um, these strings are not obviously related to the strings I'm talking about here, not too obviously related. I mean, the strings I'm talking about here, typically the ones that have been studied most, live in 10 dimensions, 10 flat dimensions. So if you demand that your space is flat, if you, the strings have to live in flat space, then the dimension should be equal to 10, essentially. There's some other version with 26, but let, let me concentrate on the 10 dimensional one. And to make the theory really nice and simple, the theory should be have a symmetry which is called supersymmetry. Uh, for now, for the purposes of this talk, supersymmetry will simply be uh, some nice symmet symmetry that makes the theory specially solvable. So just take it as this practical simplification. Um, now it might be that it's a theory of nature, and there are uh, there are some reasons for thinking uh, supersymmetric theories are nicer, but for the most, let's say, practical point of view, you can just say I'm interested in these ones because they are simple to solve. Uh, now, so this 10-dimensional uh, string theory, besides cons containing strings, it contains some other objects which I'll call, call D-brains. So these are some kind of membranes that this theory uh, has. They are kind of cosmic defects or com cosmic brains. Um, 
and such brains, I mean, such cosmic defects and so on uh, arise in other theories, like um, you know, theories with a potential, and there could be domain walls that differ, that uh, separate two regions of different uh, different uh, values of the scalar field. If, uh, but um, here you have these objects, and the nice thing they, they have is that they are described by simply saying that their excitations are given by open strings that end on this. And what this uh, says is that in the same way that um, for closed strings, we had massless spin two particles. For open strings, we have massless uh, spin one particles. And if we have many of these brains, so let's say we had n of these brains, we have these strings that can start from any brain and end on any other brain. And so we have these objects that have two indices. And the interactions among these objects uh, are um, spin one objects, again, are constrained by the symmetries. And are essentially, the low energy interactions are essentially uniquely given by yam mills theory, for the same reason as in gravity. And so when you have these objects, you take the low energy limit. Uh, again, low energy means energy is less than the string scale. And you have uh, yam mills theory. So a theory with this Lagrangian. Um, so you have these objects, which at low energies are governed by uh, yam mills theory. But this, these, are, these are objects which uh, have some tension. And so they curve the space around them. And there is an alternative uh, view of these uh, brains, which is as a source of uh, gravity. And they will curve the whole space around them. And they will give so some space which far away is 10-dimensional flat space. And near the object is uh, some curved space, some object that looks a bit like a black hole. So it's uh, extended along the dimensions where the brain is extended. So uh, if we have a brain whose word volume is 3 plus 1 dimensional, so it has three extended spatial dimensions, uh, then you, uh, on this word volume, you will have four-dimensional yam mills, so three spatial and one time uh, yam mills theory. And um, and so that's uh, from one point of view. So you'll have uh, a little brain. Forget about now the open strings. Uh, so this is some object that has a yam mills theory living on it. Uh, now we forget about this. We forget where they came from. And we just have uh, this object. So we have two points of view and two, two views on the same thing. So we have a low energy. We have gravitons at very low energies we interact very weakly so gravitons interact very weakly at low energies the lower the energy the less they interact with each other so at low energies they will interact very little with this brain and so we'll just basically have this object with yam mills theory now yam mills theory uh, in four dimensions at least classically it's scale invariant and so they interact with um, a strength which is independent of the energy now in this in this picture we have gravitons will live far away and then we can have gravitons that fall into this near horizon region of this black hole. And in that near horizon region, you, um, you have an important effect, which you have in any uh, black hole, which is the phenomenon of redshift. So if you write the metric for this object, the space-time metric, it, uh, it contains some function. Um, so along the 3 plus 1 dimension, you, uh, you have two different factors. One uh, uh, multiplies the six orthogonal dimensions of the brain, and two along the word volume dimensions. And this is some function which you can uh, calculate. And uh, according to the tension of the brains in string theory, blah, 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 you can calculate. And uh, it has this form. OK, now not all, not all the factors are important at first, uh, first brush. So the, the important point here is the following, that when r is very small, this f is very large, and this factor is very small. Now this is something that always happens when you go near a black hole independently of the function, is that the factor multiplying the time direction will become very small. Okay? That's the signature of a black hole horizon, is that the time factor is becoming 
the factor multiplying the metric is becoming very small. Okay. That means that um, um, what that means is that um, that the energies are seen from so there is proper time so the ds is the proper time and then there is some factor let's call it g zero zero uh, square root of g zero zero that multiplies uh, that relates it to the coordinate time measured far away. Okay. This this means that op that energy is measured far away. Let me call them et. Uh, they are related again by the same factor, g0, 0, and the energy is measured with respect to proper time, E proper. These are the energies an observer who sits at the fixed value of R measures. Okay, So for example, um, he could have a little, I don't know, uh, let's say this, this is an observer of some mass m. He has a little particle that measures some mass m according to him. Um, let's say he has a proton uh, sitting near the horizon of a black hole. That same proton, as seen very far away, will have an energy which is very, very tiny because this factor is very small. This happens whenever you have a black hole horizon, this big redshift. Now, in this context, what it means is, uh, let's see, is there any question about this? Th this, is this is one of the most important formulas in the whole discussion. It's important that this understood well. Uh, so, uh, right, so if we are in this room and we're falling into a black hole and we measure, I don't know, the mass of this thing as a certain number of kilograms, uh, the same, or an observer made like by the same matter is m that makes us, but is sitting very far away from the black hole horizon will see the same object as being much lighter. Okay. Um, okay, so there is this factor that becomes very small. And what that means is that if you are very close, to all these excitations that are very close to the black hole horizon look from the point of view of an observer who is far away, they look as if they had very low energies. Okay. Um, so then here we have two things that have low energies. One is all these excitations near the black hole horizon, and the other one is all these fields described by Jan Mills theory. Okay? And the if you just assume that these two things are the same, are describing the same thing, you get the uh, gauge gravity duality. Okay? So which says that this Jan Mills theory now you forget where this came from in string theory and about the whole brain discussion and so on. And you just equate two things, the two low energy descriptions. One, on one side we have the Jan Mills description or gauge theory description. So this is in three plus one dimensions and contains this uh, UN gauge theory. This is a four dimensional quantum field theory uh, in four dimensions should be equal to a uh, certain gravity theory in uh, or string theory if you don't like if you don't like the word string ignore it for the moment gravity theory in uh, ten dimensions and the ten dimensions are uh, given by a particular geometry one there is an s5 and the s5 comes from this phi sphere times a uh, certain space which is called five-dimensional anti-sitter space. I'm going to explain what it is in a second. So gravity in this space is the same as Jan Mills theory in this space. Okay? Yeah. Can you explain why there are not, no, you have two different low energy descriptions, yes. but mm -hmm. why don't you have both and why are they the same? Yeah, so the idea is that you don't have both. You don't have this and in addition that. That was the idea. So people in the beginning, they thought you had both. And, uh, the, 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 well, it's, uh, it should be true because this is the most reasonable thing that could be true once you... <laughs> um, okay. I mean, you have two low energy... The, the thing is that from this point of view, you just have the Jan Mills description, and it's a complete description of the system. So you have a graviton comes in and becomes Jan Mills degrees of freedom, right? And here you seem to have more, to have more complicated things, but then... Um, you realize that, well, it could be that this whole region is, um, maybe it's described by the same of this, 
by the same. Um, this whole region is describing the same physics as this Young Mills uh, region. And indeed, if you. Young Mills description is complete. But it yeah. No, it doesn't. Yeah. So, but well, that's that's why this relationship is useful because uh, in the uh, Yamel's description you don't have the black holes. So, um, yeah. So it's um, um, the idea is that the presence of the black hole horizon is related to the fact that Yamel's um, is scale invariant, has degrees of freedom at very very low energies. That uh, you have a theory. So whenever uh, you have one of these large end theories where uh, in the large end limit, there isn't an energy gap. It is uh, very likely you'll have a black hole horizon in the dual gravity description. Well, like we, we could <laughs> say it a little more precisely than that. But um, yeah, I mean, and, and, and if you compute it, so originally when people, well, we started doing cal calculations of, let's say, the absorption of gravitons out of, uh, from these brains and I don't know, the, the thermal free energy of these brains and various uh, properties of all these brains and, and comparing the two sides and we noticed that they gave the same answers and then, um, um, I, well, they sometimes gave the same answer and sometimes they didn't. And, but they all, all the reasons, the re they gave the same answers when we were taking the low energy limit. And when they didn't <laughs> give the exactly the same answers, it was due to, um, to another property, which is the fact that um, uh, that has to do with the regime of validity of various approximations. So these two theories are supposed to be exactly equal, uh, but the radius of the space and so on here, so the radius of the sphere or the anti-sitter space in string units, uh, for some reason is to the fourth power, the fourth power is not very important, is equal to the yam mills coupling here times n. So this relates the quantities that appear in the left, in the right hand side to some quantities that appear here in the left hand side. Um, now it's possible also, well, now if uh, you can easily do calculations here, you can easily do calculations here when gn, g square n is much more than one because then all these loops I was drawing in the very beginning can be neglected and you have the propagation of the free particles. If not, you have to draw these loops and calculate them, find all the formulas, and it's complicated. And so this is uh, when perturbation theory is val is easy, okay? Easy and applicable, and you can calculate easily. On this side is when this happens. Here, um, in principle, you have uh, a string theory on this background, but well, as you, um, I mean. You, you don't know exactly how to analyze string theory on this background, and certainly you didn't know um, many years ago. No, now more is known, and I'll explain what is known, but it's, it's pretty difficult if the radius of curvature is arbitrary. Now, if the radius of curvature is very large, so when r over ls is much bigger than 1, right? That was the regime where you could forget about string theory and just think about gravity. And you just look at this as a solution, particular solution of some system of 10-dimensional gravity equations, and you can analyze those in any easy way. Those can be analyzed simply. Um, and so that's the regime where this is easy. So this is easy when g yam mills is much bigger than 1. OK? So this is when uh, n. Sorry, I forgot the n. So when uh, this is much bigger than 1, this is easy. When this is much more than 1, this side is easy. OK? So this is one of the the things that makes this relationship difficult to test. I mean, because when one side is easy, the other is hard, and vice versa. But it's also something that makes, makes it useful, because when one if I hard calculations on one side become easy calculations on the other. Okay. Um, so, um, and as I was mentioning, some calculations were not giving the same answer. And the reason they were not giving the same answer is because one was done sometimes when gn was very small, the other one was done when gn was very large. And some of them, they, they didn't have to give the same answer, even though the relationship is true. Um, OK, so that was the uh, original motivation. And um, I, OK, let me, I haven't yet explained what ADS space is, is yet, but I'll explain it in a second. Before, I'd like to mention one more thing. Um, so there is this parameter lambda, sometimes call, people call lambda, which is g square n. Uh, and when, when it is very small or close to zero, we have 
Young Mills perturbation theory. I'm just going to re-emphasize the same thing that I was discussing. When it's it is of order one, we have some no man's land where no method is correct. And uh, here we have the regime where gravity is easy, right? OK? So here, is this clear? Is this diagram clear what I'm meaning by this? Now, this whole thing, everything is the string in ADS. So string in ADS, strings on this background, they can describe all this region, OK? If you knew how to solve strings on this background. And by now, people know how to solve uh, at least some aspects of strings on these backgrounds. And you can calculate some things mostly as they go from one side to the other and check that uh, the two sides match as they are supposed to match. Um, I'll probably discuss some examples later if I have some time. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Say yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Then you move to yes. gravity, yes. which you feel spin two. Yes. Yes. Where is this one spin costing? Right, right. Very good. So this is um this is an important question. Um well the perhaps the best answer and most uh, most correct is to say that the spin one boson is really not not completely observable because it's not gauge invariant. It's not a uh, color singlet. It has, it has net color, and just a single gauge boson is not observable. Um, and so that's, what, that's why you don't directly see the gauge bosons. Um, that, that, that is correct, but it's a little unsatisfying because you, you still, I mean, you, you still have some, would like to have something that behaves kind of like a spin one, li like the boson. Um, now, um, so that's one point. The second point is, uh, you asked me about the spin two, and let me mention what the spin two thing is. Uh, first of all, the also the spin two is not quite observable in the sense I'm going to try to explain right now. In the sense that the in quantum gravity there are uh, no local observables. So this, this is something that sounds surprising the first time you hear it, but uh, after a while you get used to it. So if you have a localized region of space, you cannot find the well-defined observables, and the well-defined mathematically precise observables are only measured far away, where the fluctuations of geometry are not very large. So in this context, the only observables that we have here are defined at the boundary of this space. I probably should have explained a little bit better what ADS is before answering your question, but then let me try anyway. And so ADS space is some space that has uh, four dimensions, the fourth, same four dimensions we had here, and then some extra direction, and that ends on some boundary. And this boundary is sort of infinitely far away in space, uh, so it's a region where quantum gravity fluctuations are suppressed, and you c it's a kind of solid platform from which you can do quantum gravity experiments. So you can send in gravity waves and absorb gravity waves from this position. So a spin two particle, the best you can uh, get from the spin, the spin two particles are, are th is the possibility of calculating probability, let's say amplitudes that you send in, w what happens when you send in some particles and receive some other particles. Okay. Um, so you send in gravity waves, and you ask what's the probability that they split, and they become two gravity waves, for example. Or you send two gravity waves, and they become two other gravity waves. Uh, these are, in the gauge theory, they correspond to correlation functions of the stress tensor. So you, uh, you take four points, in this case, one, two, three, and four. And you make two, four insertions of the, the stress tensor. And you calculate this in the field theory. So the stress tensor is just the ordinary stress tensor for young mills theory. So t mu nu is equal to the trace of f mu delta f nu delta minus the trace term. Um, so that's the usual uh, stress tensor for young mills theory. And if you compute this in the young mills theory using Feynman diagrams and so on, it's supposed to give you the same as, uh, as what you get from these spin two particles. Now, in a loose way, you can say that um, the stress tensor of the spin two particle is basically like two spin one particles. 
So the state created out of these two spin one particles, which is not a color singlet, two spin one particles sort of moving far away from each other, um, corresponds to a gravity wave that is falling in uh, into ADS space. Maybe I'll, I think I'll try to, um, I'll explain that uh, that in a second a, bit, a bit better. But I mean, the answer to your question uh, has different degrees of uh, of pres oh well. I'm not sure if you're satisfied. Can you ask, ask again, and I'll may I ask, ask a little later. And if you're not satisfied, and I'll try to give more, uh, uh, try to explain more. Where, um, yeah. But I it's very important that we, in order to check that, we we should not match things which are not gauge invariant. So, one general philosophy philosophical point is that gauge symmetries are not. Um, are not fundamental quantities that the theory has, but they are just simply redundant um, redundancies of our description. Redundancies of our description, and um, so we shouldn't be surprised we don't find the gauge the gauge degrees of freedom. Now, you asked me about something which is a little more physical, which are the gauge bosons themselves. And the gauge bosons, you don't see them individually, but you could see them in, as singularities of correlators. For example, if you take two correlation functions, sometimes they have singularities correspond to the exchange of a very fast moving gauge boson. Now in ADS space, that would cr in, in this case, that uh, actually corresponds to a situation where when you uh, make some points approach, you have a little piece of string. So there is some object here with uh, some strings and a little piece of string that approaches the boundary and moves uh, fast between two points on the boundary. So a string that has, that is moving close to the boundary and moving fast, that's uh, something b fairly close to a gauge boson, or a, c or, or a few gauge bosons. Now, the reason I say fairly close is because um, in order for it to be ga a gauge boson, you need to be a weak coupling. Weak coupling means highly curved. And so this, is, this would be correct if we are doing dealing with a string moving in a highly curved space. So in a highly, very highly curved space, the string splits into various pieces, I each of which move independently. And you see this in the, exact, in the more exact solutions uh, that you get by integrability. Um, well, I don't know. I give them more. I'm OK, so are there any other questions? OK, now I'll, I'll describe a little more ADS space, which uh, I've postponed. Uh, OK, so ADS space is the following space. Um, so you have four flat dimensions. And then uh, you have an extra dimension. And, um, and you have a, a redshift factor, which multiplies all, all of these dimensions equally, uh, which is 1 over c squared. Now this is just, just the definition, but it has several properties. and. This space is uniquely defined by this, by these properties. So, let me try to explain. Now, first of all, the uh, this space is invariant under. Well, of course, it's invariant under Poincaré symmetries. So, if you do any Poincaré transformation here, rotation, boost, translations, is invariant in the same way as ordinary four-dimensional spaces. But in addition, it has uh, symmetry under a rescaling of both x and c. So if you rescale both of these coordinates, this metric is invariant. So this is um, this type of symmetry. That means that uh, the space looks the same at all values of c. So if you sit at a different value of c, you'll look that the space is the same. You will, if you are an observer in this space, you will not, not notice at which value of c you are sitting. You will not. Um, the same way that you cannot say at which value of the absolute position you are, because the space is translation invariant. However, uh, the space has a big gravitational potential, which is this G00. Zero zero. I, I called it redshift factor, but I could also have called it gravitational potential. It's the same thing. Um, that um, is sharply increasing at c equal to 0. So what this means is exactly what you think it would mean, that if you have a particle that uh, tries to move here, what do you think will happen? And you have big gravitational potential barrier. Uh, 
So imagine you have, you have this space, you have this big gravitational potential barrier, and there is a particle coming in from the left. It bounces back, yes. So it will bounce back. Okay. Any massive particle will just bounce back. Okay. So um, that's uh, what we have. And this region at c equal to zero, this region of very small c, is called the boundary of the space. Now notice, notice the funny thing that um, so I, I mentioned the fact that all of, all. Um, all of the observers see the same at different c positions, but that thing they see is a big force towards larger values of c. Okay? It's similar to being in the gravitational field of the Earth, where it doesn't matter how high you are, at least in the linear approximation, you see always the same gravity field pushing you down. And you have this kind of translation symmetry in the c direction, but uh, I mean, what is symmetric is the fact that you always have the same force, and you can't tell how high you are by just measuring the gravitational acceleration, at least to leading order. Here is the same thing, except that here is exact. So you, every, every observer here sees a big gravitational force pushing it to the C direct, to the larger values of C. I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I said big, but I mean, it depends on what the radius of curvature of the space is. So it's very, the radius of curvature is very, very small. This is, will, will be a very gentle force pushing it, uh, and so on. Um, OK. Now. Um, so that's that's this uh, that's this space. Now, one question you can ask is: um, We started with the four-dimensional gauge theory, which is defined in three plus one dimensions, um, and we ended up with this space, which is uh, has the three plus one plus an extra dimension. So, what is this extra dimension in the gauge theory? Okay. And the basic idea is that the extra dimension or the value of c is the size of uh, an object on the boundary. So on the boundary we have, we can have, uh, let's say we make an excitation, and that excitation can have some characteristic size. And as time progresses, this excitation uh, will have a bigger and bigger size. That's what you would expect that happens. This is a theory without the scale, so this uh, excitation will start um, diffusing and becoming bigger and bigger, um, and or alternatively, even if we don't ask what what it does dynamically, if you have some excitation of some size and you apply a scale transformation, which is a symmetry of the theory, uh, you get um, an excitation which is related by a symmetry of a smaller size. So these are two excitations which are related by a symmetry, the rescaling symmetry of the theory. Yeah, I should probably have explained the fact that uh, yeah, Yamel's theory in three plus one dimensions um, with supersymmetry, with enough supersymmetry, with maximal supersymmetry, uh, is uh, scale invariant. So it's uh, classically the action is always scale invariant, but uh, with supersymmetry is also scale invariant quantum mechanically. And so these are two excitations in this theory that are related by the symmetry. And in the bulk, they correspond to, um, to uh, two excitations, which are at different positions of the C variable. So the, this bigger one, for example, corresponds to some value C1. And the smaller one, uh, let's say the red one, which is smaller, corresponds to some other value C2. And in the bulk, they are two particles of exactly the same proper size. The proper size in the bulk is exactly the same. They're exactly the same particles, and they particle, and they only differ by their position in the c-direction. That's just the kinematics, and the dynamics is also the same. So the fact that here there is this gravitational force pushing them to larger values of c is the same as uh, the tendency of, uh, of massless particles to want to become more and more extended, just to travel uh, further. Okay, just there, this stuff moves out at the speed of light. Uh, these particles also stuff start moving in, and that's uh, how we translate these two two things. Now, um, now we can even um, try to explain the origin of this extra dimension, uh, sort of a la Landau Lifshitz. So, in the first uh, chapter of the Landau Lifshitz mechanics book, uh, they talk about the action for a free particle. I don't know if you read it. Or 
it's familiar. Well, anyway, uh, we read it when we studied mechanics. And, um, and th th he starts deriving it from some general symmetry principles. Uh, he says, well, you have translation symmetry, Poincare symmetry. What could the action for a massive massless particle be? And well, he says, well, the most general action can only be this, OK, um, with two derivatives and so on. Um, now we have something which is uh, this object, which has both a position and a size. Let's call it the size C. Okay? From the moment, let's ignore the, the fact that it's the same C that we will get in the end, but some size. And we'll try to write the most general action we can have consistent with the symmetries of the theory. The symmetries now also include rescaling symmetry. And if you think about it in the same, with the same logic of lambda Lipschitz, Lipschitz, you will find that uh, this is the most general action you can write down. Okay, with some parameter here, and this is indeed the action uh, you get for uh, for a massive particle uh, in ADS. Okay, so it's just the um, so this is as simple as you can you can write, and this this has a more more, if you wish, more mathematical or sophisticated statement, which is that if you want to classify states in a conformal field theory, um, you use it using the representations of the conformal group. And the same group classifies the states of particles living in ADS space, and these representations are in one to one correspondence. So they but I, I it really boils down to the same uh, qualitative argument, or this, these arguments we am um, pointing out here. I mean, strictly speaking, this argument is only valid when this m is very large. But otherwise, you have to use the wave equation. But uh, the argument is exactly the same. Um, OK, so this explains why, or at least gives you an idea for why, of why you expect this extra dimension. And uh, yeah, why at least it's not so strange to have uh, an extra dimension. Okay. Are there questions about this? No. Um, I think we are supposed to stop at some point. Uh, maybe this might be a good time. and We can stop. And then what time would you like to start? At, uh, at 9? Or yeah? OK. So let's, let's continue at 9 then.